let me thank you uh, for having me. Um, thinking about manuscript um, provenance beyond Europe, this is the um, this is the topic of this uh, this year's series. Um, and I want to extend, um, I'm very grateful um, to both the organizers in Hamburg and in Gotha uh, for having me, for letting me uh, actually think uh, about these topics, think aloud uh, with you, uh, since these are issues that, uh, you know, that barely ever leave me, at least in my professional life. I do have uh, a life uh, beyond that, but uh, when I, whenever I'm, um, um, as an academic, uh, this is really at the heart of uh, of the work that I am doing. Um, the question of uh, how Arabic script manuscripts came to European and North American collections and the role they played there uh, has also always been of great concern for my work, but I am uh, really most interested in everything that came before this relocation. And in the grand scheme of things, this is uh, going to be a um, a... Uh, one of the main points of this talk, the European history is a marginal aspect when compared to the rich lives these artifacts had sometimes for centuries in the Middle East. These lives are precisely what I have been investigating for many years now. In writing and speaking about the libraries and book cultures of the Ottoman period from the 15th to the 19th century, I am often confronted with three deeply ingrained notions that audiences usually hold. The first is a very general perception of decline. Um, and here, uh, to um, as a stand-in for decline, we have a Mamluk uh, palace in decline in ruins. The idea, um, a mistaken idea, but a widely held one nonetheless, that in the past there were these unbelievably rich treasure houses of knowledge containing hundreds of thousands or even millions of books, and that um, what we are looking at in the 16th, 17th, or 18th century are mere shadows of the so-called golden age, whenever that was for you, like Abbasid Baghdad or Fatimid Cairo or Omayyad Cordoba, etc., are usually named. The second notion is that this decline is directly tied to a colonial history here represented by Napoleon conquering Egypt. Napoleon and his army, of course, didn't do it alone. Um, and um, Namely, that the perceived poor state of libraries was shaped by what has most recently been called a book drain to Europe. According to this, it was increasingly hard for readers in the Arab world to find stimulating literature to study because Europeans had taken away the best. And then lastly, that before Europeans stole everything, it was already stolen, namely in the Ottoman looting of the Mamluk realm upon the conquest of Egypt in 1516 and 1517 here represented by a picture of the last Mamluk Sultan being killed by the Ottoman, by Ottoman soldiers. Um, according to this notion, it was then in 1517 that the splendid libraries of the Mamluks were plundered and shipped off to Constantinople, as we can still read in a most recent authoritative book on Mamluk book culture. I quote, the present collections of Mamluk manuscripts in Turkish libraries were found in a citadel and looted by Sultan Selim during his military campaign. I will present um, no to that to those notions. I have to say uh, right from the outset, I will present a world of books in which Europeans played but a marginal role. Although the manuscript collections in Leiden, Paris, Berlin, London, Princeton, or of course Gotha, contain many thousands of volumes in Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, and often amazing ones, these are generally speaking, and with notable exceptions, not a sign of any elevated role of theft and violence or that people in Cairo and Damascus were deprived of books to enjoy and to study because they were all gone. But I will also say from the outset, just not to be misunderstood, that does not mean that I would argue against or deny the reality of colonial mindsets, European or otherwise, colonial exploitation, or even the need for restitution in specific cases. The aim today fundamentally is to probe two of these notions that I see as misconceptions. First, that European libraries since the 17th century depleted Middle Eastern and North African libraries, and that stakeholders in these regions could not defend against this due to an imbalance in economic and political power dynamics. And second, that the wealth of splendid Mamluk manuscripts found today in Istanbul can be traced back to the violent capture of the Mamluk realm by the Ottomans at the beginning of the 16th century. In essence, I want to put aside those narratives and replace them with a sober analysis of how books really were produced, traded, read, 
preserved, studied, endowed, re-endowed, captured, translocated, sometimes looted. To achieve this, I will focus our attention on Constantinople, not as a, sta not as a storehouse for plunder, which as an imperial center, and as any imperial center, it surely also was, but as a central note for centuries, the primary point of attraction in a far-flung world of books. In this talk, I will try and touch on all of these points by presenting to you the story of just one book. I think I can do that because this is a very special book that in fact contains numerous stories. That book is the Kitab al Arani, or Book of Songs, authored by Ali, Ali bin al Hussein bin Muhammad al Umawi, generally known as Abul Faraj al Isfahani, who lived in the 10th century and who was a direct descendant of the last Umayyad Caliph, his family thus remnants of the dynasty that ruled the entirety of the Islamic lands and therefore much of the known world at large before being unsettled by the successful Abbasid revolution of 750. The most famous text he authored, the Book of Songs, is a towering monument both in terms of its sheer size and its place in the history of Arabic literature. With particular songs as a starting point, Al-Isfahani painted a sprawling panorama of Arabic music, but since his work is devoid of any musical notations, has often been read as a gigantic compendium of Arabic verse together with biographies of singers and poets and a mass of historical anecdotes from the pre-Islamic period until the author's own days in the 10th century. The text is a perfect fit for the purposes of this talk for a number of reasons. First, it is emblematic for the alleged book drain to Europe. The fact that Ulrich Jasper Seetzen, the German traveler whose acquisitions are at the heart of the Gotha manuscript collection, that he was allegedly unable, about a decade after the French expedition of 1798, to, to locate a single copy of the book in Cairo, has been taken as a powerful argument for the impoverished state of the Egyptian book market after the French occupation. Seetzen, we are informed, most recently in a very influential book, couldn't find a copy at the beginning of the 19th century because the French, I quote, took the last copy. Although which copy that would have been is not clear at all. Gotha usually holds, uh, actually holds um, a part of the work um, that Seetzen had, had bought, so it's, it's just not a complete copy, it's a fragment of it, as is usually the case. There are very, very few, um, in very few instances where there is actually a, a complete copy of such a, moment, a, a monumental work. Then the text was also the impetus to produce one of the most outstandingly splendid productions in the history of Arabic book, book art or art in general. And you can see that here, some of the frontispieces uh, of, the, of the Book of Songs as, um, that I'm going to present today that, is, uh, that are still preserved. Um, thus, we will start our journey not in Constantinople, but in Mosul at the beginning of the 13th century. There, the Zengid dynasty nominally ruled over a city that was a center of trade and artistic production, and that was in fact ruled by an Atabek, a tutor to the ruling dynasty's princes by the name of Badreddin Lo'lo. He, Lo'lo, was a very shrewd politician who was smart enough to die just before the Mongols would have obliterated principalities like his. But he is mostly known as an outstanding patron of many works of art, especially of splendid metalware, as you can see here. This box in the middle of the screen, this is uh, something, this kind of brass uh, with inlaid silver work. We have many splendid productions of this kind with his name inscribed on it from this period. But the whole region was also a center for particularly high class book production, especially noteworthy for illustrated manuscripts. We still have surviving examples of Hariri's Makamat or works of medicine adorned with inventive calligraphy and images. And Lolo was not to be outdone in this regard either. In Ramadan of 616, that is November 20, uh, 1219, Muhammad bin, Ali, uh, bin Abi Talib al-Badri put the final touch to the last volume, the 20th, of the Kitab al-Arani, or Book of Songs, which he had spent the past four years of his life making. This was most likely done in the town of Mosul, because a large and splendid frontispiece image suggests that the volume, just like the 19 ones preceding it, was dedicated to the de facto ruler of the city, Badr Tim Lolo, just like the copy its name, Al Badri, suggests that he was likely, at least originally, one of his slaves. While author portraits appear to have been a specialty of northern Iraq's high end book production at the time, Robert Hillenbrand notes that these were, a quote, the first surviving royal frontispieces in Islamic book painting. And that, with regard to the text which they adorn, without any connection to its content, 
quote again, no other illustrated text of comparable length survives in the whole corpus of medieval Arab painting. So this is quite a book, you know, very outstanding. Originally, this set consisted of 20 volumes. Today, seven volumes of this Mosul set of the Kitab al-Arani survive. And we find Badr al-Din likeness at the beginning of all but volumes two, which has a crowded female court scene and which you can see here on the screen on the upper left side. And seven, the frontispiece of which is now lost. We will start our examination with volume 20, the last. We are still not arrived in Constantinople since this volume is presently in Copenhagen, where it must have arrived sometime in the first half of the 19th century. Sorry for introducing some European provenance history here, but we will not um, deal with it very much. Seemingly then, this looks like the typical story of questionable European collecting by any means in the age of imperialism that is only now slowly being given the appropriate scrutiny in our museums and archives. This impression is only strengthened when we take note of what is left of a seal impression in two places on the manuscript. Admittedly, there is not much to take note of anymore, but trust me when I say that this is the seal of one Abdel Baqi bin Ali ibn al Arabi, who died in 971, that is 1564, a man whom we can identify and who was, among many other things, the judge of Egypt in the years 960 to 61, that is 1553 to 54. I know that even though the seal inscription is pretty destroyed, because I know this seal very well. Here you have a, um, an image of the seal, how it should look when it is uh, rather complete. In fact, I know it very well because I published an article about it just this year in which I based my analysis of it on 45 volumes on which I could identify it throughout the world. Since then, my corpus of manuscripts with this seal has probably doubled, not the least due to the uh, Kitab al-Arani manuscripts. But my conclusions have not changed. Nearly always do we find with the seal also traces of endowment inscriptions and wherever these inscriptions are readable, which is quite often, the institutions that the books were endowed to were in Cairo. Many of the volumes also clearly remained there after the seal was put on them, some until today. So it was not Abdel Baki talk, uh, taking these uh, volumes away from endowments, but registering their presence there. What the presence of the seal on any manuscript suggests then is clear. In the middle of the 16th century, this was present in an endowed book collection in Cairo. And indeed, we see this confirmed in a number of endowment statements that are dutifully destroyed throughout the Kitab al-Arani manuscript. Just in one instance, is the inscription readable enough for me to identify the name of the institution to which it had once belonged? This was the Madrasa al-Mu'ayyadiyya. This is Mu'ayyadiyya. Here's the name, the word Waqf. This would have been something like Madrasa. So this is uh, the Waqf inscription for the al-Mu'ayyadiyya. The Mu'ayyadiyya was the funerary complex of the Mamluk Sultan al-Mu'ayyad Sheikh, who ruled between 1412 and 1421, and which comprised a mosque, madrasa, and library. Interestingly, we read that the Sultan stocked this library partly with books he had brought down from the citadel in Cairo, therefore alluding to some sort of elusive royal collection in which the Irani volumes would have been a perfect fit. Furthermore, the Sultan and some men from his circle are also said to have spent great sums to add to the collection particularly precious copies. In such an environment, the luxurious image of the ideal ruler that we encounter on the frontispieces of the Kitab al-Arani volumes can easily be seen as a perfect target acquisition. The Mu'ayyadiyya is also infamous as a site of Ottoman looting through the report of an eyewitness that of the Mamluk chronicler Ibn Iyaz, who reported in March 1517, shortly after the conquest of Cairo by Salim's troops, I quote, then the viziers were tempted to take the precious books that are in the Madrasa al Mahmudiyya and al Mu'ayyadiyya, the one that we are talking about here, and al Sarit Moshiya and other madrasas that contain precious books. They transported them to them and laid their hands on them and did not know the illicit from the illicit in this regard. End of quote. In the past, these few lines have been taken to record the depletion, even wholesale destruction of these institutions, an accusation, an accusation of open-ended magnitude since the, the, the addition of the phrase and other madrasas that contain precious books leaves the door wide open for speculations about any such collection in Mamluk Cairo. But regardless of the overall scope of this alleged book drain, the Mo'ayyadiyya library is specifically mentioned by Ibn Iyaz. 
Um, by the way, so the, this uh, is a uh, round plan of the institution that I took from uh, Doris Behrens Abu Saif's um, book on Mamluk uh, book culture, in which she has colored this space where the library would have been in the Mu'ayyadiyya. So this is where the Kitab al Arani would have been put at this point. With the seal impression of the judge Abdel Baki, we can acquit the Ottoman conquerors from this charge, at least in this specific case. In the 16th century, the Kitab al Arani is safely tucked away in a Mamluk institution. But then in the 19th, we find it in Copenhagen. This is convenient and suspicious since what happened in between, among many other things, of course, is the three year long French occupation that started in 1798. And the French are accused of ravaging the libraries of Egypt and bringing out innumerable, innumerable treasures back to Europe. And even where they did not do this directly, they can be accused of creating the circumstances in which this illicit plundering could have taken place. But we can absolve the French too by noticing another inscription that nobody has registered before. This one at the very end of the manuscript and in Maghribi script, that is the script prevalent in North Africa to the west of Egypt. In it, a man called Atayyib bin Nasr bin Qasim al Kharaq al Tatawuni buys the book from Muhammad bin Ahmad al Malih al Tatawuni. The Nisba al Tatawuni refers to the city of Tetouan on the northernmost tip of Morocco. And Atayyib says that this is also where he resides. So he doesn't just call himself a Tatawuni, but repeats the Nisba and says, Atatawuni at Dar, this is where I also live. So he was not just of Moroccan origin and temporarily residing in Cairo, as many Moroccans would have, especially for trade and for studying at the Asa Mosque. The seller too is from Tetuan, and the scribe also has a Maghribi hand. So this could have happened in Egypt, but it is also likely to have happened in Morocco. Most crucially, all of this, and therefore the extraction from the Mamluk endowment, happened in or before 1194, that is 1780. This is when this uh, uh, deed of sale is dated. So well before the French came to Egypt. At the moment, I don't know how exactly this volume of the Kitab al Arani then came to Copenhagen, but we can say that it left its endowment not because of any European book trade. And the same can be said of the next two volumes we will now turn to, finally arriving thereby in Constantinople. Precisely, we are in the madrasa of the highest religious authority of the Ottoman Empire, the Sheikh al Islam, at the time Faisullah Effendi. This madrasa, with an enormous book collection, was established in 1112, that is 1700, at the height of Faisullah's power, a power, however, that would not outlast this foundation for very long. Faisullah was a highly controversial figure. He was not only a religious authority dealing with matters of Islamic law and doctrine, he also wielded an outsized amount of behind-the-scenes political power, according to his critics, an unsupportable amount of it, as he was a childhood teacher and companion of the Sultan and was involved in political decisions as people in his position had usually not been. And those decisions were generally not as beneficial as expected. After a string of military defeats and economic calamities, a rebellion in the capital demanded change from the Sultan, Mustafa II. For the Sultan to appease the rebels to save his life, he had to give up his trusted companion. So Faisullah could not cherish his royal manuscripts due, his, due to his execution already three years after establishing his library in 1703. This violent end did not change that he left one of the best book collections of the city. And very many of those books can be traced back to Egypt through their colophones and manuscript notes. How did he get these volumes? Particularly, how did he get those of the Kitab al Arani? He got them, like roughly 30 other books, from one of the greatest bibliophiles of the city, or even the empire as a whole. Abu Bakr bin Rustam bin Ahmad bin Mahmud al-Shirwani, whose ownership and inscription you can see here, encircled in red. His not-so-illustrious job description is that of a scribe, a katib. Not one who copied books, but one who kept accounts, could write flourished correspondence and impeccable documents in a beautiful handwriting. Of course, he was not just any scribe. Throughout a splendid career, he would climb the professional ladder to achieve the highest post a Khatib or secretary in the Ottoman Empire could hope for, Ra'is al kutab In this position, he was responsible for the correspondence with foreign powers and therefore de facto a foreign minister. This is what he would have looked like uh, on the left of the screen. This is an image by the um, Flemish painter Van Moor. Uh, who painted a lot of the personalities uh, that uh, Abu Bakr al-Shirwani would have been in contact with, 
uh, a lot of famous personalities, some not so famous personalities, uh, a lot of the what we know of the visual culture of uh, how life in Istanbul at the time looked like we know from through one more. He might have known Abu Bakr al-Sharwani, but to my knowledge, he never painted him. But this is probably as close to a portrait of him that we can get. This is uh, a man in the same position. Uh, Shirwani would have probably looked very much the same in terms of his dress and uh, his position, the way he worked. So uh, this is another uh, Rais al Kutab who, who lived a little uh, later than Shirwani, but it's it's very very much his likeness. Um, so Ashirwani and Faisullah were moving in the same upper class circles at a certain time. And with Faisullah, the most powerful man at the court, we can see how someone like Ashirwani would have wanted to please him with gifts that are appropriate to his standing and learning, as the royal Kitab al Arani would certainly have been. Although Ashirwani was at the helm of the Ottoman administration through times of war and crises that have seen a lot of historiographical scrutiny, he is still rather elusive as a person. He served as Reis al Kutab no less than five times, but when I go through the literature, it seems that whenever something monumental happened, he was always out of office. Still, we see European visitors meet him and converse with a man who is highly interested and eager to talk about science and books, a man who is a lover of mathematics, a man who does not only gift books, but in one instance, a young girl to the Sultan for him to marry. And after the Sultan dies, that is Mustafa II, whom we met before, Shirwani, as an old man, marries her himself. Yes, although I am totally in love with Ashirwani the bibliophile, let's not idealize him. Whatever he might have personally thought or felt, he was part of a class of people who owned human beings, sometimes for sexual exploitation, and exploited others in order to uphold the luxury of a royal elite. So I guess you can accurately describe my feelings for him as mixed. Books are great, though. So there are glimpses of a colorful life here and there, and Ashirwani must have been present at significant junctures in, his in history, but overall, the sources do not really allow to see his personality and consequently no monograph books or articles have been written about him. Until now, that is, because he will be at the center of my next book. Or rather, it will be his books that mostly have to stand in for the man and his age and tell fascinating stories. And the books are plentiful. It has been 15 years since I saw an ownership note of his for the first time here in Leipzig. And I have continued to find him ever since by the hundreds all over the world. I have said this before in a digital environment like this, wherever you are watching this from, chances are that you are not far from a Shivani manuscript. Because he's so well represented in all the great, uh, in all the great collections in the, around the world. Ironically, Gota is one of the very few collections where I have not found one. Generally speaking, they are some of the most splendid, most refined, most interesting books there are. They are also way too many to give an adequate account of here. Before he became one of the most important administrators of the empire and a staple at the Ottoman court, Shirwani was born in an eastern province. And we meet him first on a trip to Egypt, where he spent several years in the entourage of powerful Ottoman dignitaries. So the suspicion immediately arises. Was he the one who took care to extract those books from their rightful rep repository in the Mu'ayyadiyya Madrasa, as Ottomans are supposed to do? By the way, I uh, haven't said that yet, but uh, all of these volumes too, the ones in Istanbul too, they bear the seal of Abd al-Baqi, uh, Ibn al-Arabi. So they were also in the middle of the 16th century together with the other one in Copenhagen in an endowment uh, in, the, in Cairo. So was he the one responsible? No, he wasn't. And we know that because there is this other little note written unceremoniously across the splendid decoration uh, of the patron's painting. It says no more than that this book once belonged to one Ahmed ibn al-Ajami. From the complex and not always straightforward information found in a broad corpus of his manuscript notes, uh, I found his name on 28 volumes, four of them in Gotha. We can induce with certainty that this was Ahmed Abu al-Aziz bin Shihab al-Din Ahmed bin Muhammad bin Ahmed bin Ibrahim bin Ali bin Muhammad al-Ajami al-Ahmadi al-Wafai al-Shafi'i, who lived from 1605 to 1675. The Syrian historian Muhammad al-Amin al-Muhibbi devotes a biography to him, which, among other things, shows that news of his voluminous and choice library had even reached Damascus. I quote Muhibi now, he was the authority for the noble ones of the age in reviewing intricate questions because of his far-reaching knowledge, the breadth of his reading, and the great number of books he collected. 
A particular mention is made of his authority in questions of history and Arabic genealogy. Muhibi also quotes the travelogue of Al Khayari, a student of, Al -Ahmad bin, uh, of Ahmad ibn al Ajami, with more information on Ibn al Ajami's intellectual profile. Quote Al Khayari the, He collected books written in all fields and arts. He stored and acquired them, that is their content, and in all their divisions, in their parts, categories, and varieties, so that he himself became the treasury, Khizana, as he uses the name, uh, the word uh, um, that is also used for book collections, for libraries. So he became the treasury of knowledge in Cairo on whom one would rely in the transmission of texts and to whom people pointed in these matters. He was the support of the nobles who traveled the seas of knowledge with the help of his books. Certainly this was someone, an up and coming intellectual who wanted to earn his place among the nobility of cultured and learned men would have wanted to know. In fact, it is easier to imagine the young Ashirwani discussing books in the Salon of Ahmed ibn al Ajami than to think that they would not have known each other when they were both residing in Egypt. Examples like this show how knowledge about the actual books can bring life to such generic descriptions of libraries as we find in the biographical sources. Another thing that we can gauge from his manuscripts are the connections Ahmed ibn al Ajami forged with elite Ottoman residents of Egypt. There is the example of another manuscript in the Faisula collection, Faisula 281, which he had copied himself in, in 1057 uh, of the Hitra, and then gifts to the vizier Ibrahim Pasha. Another volume in Istanbul, manuscript Veliuddin Effendi 824, was owned by him, but also bears an ijaza, so that's a transmission, uh, of no uh, 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 transmission certificate, he gave to one Mustafa Beg al-Wazir al-A'zam, the Grand Vizier, in 1081. As there was no Grand Vizier of that name in 1081, nor was there a governor of Egypt by that name, it is most likely that the Mustafa in question was Merzifon Lukara Mustafa Pasha, who was a member of the Köprülü household and would indeed go on to become Grand Vizier a few years later. At this time, he was the deputy of his Köprülü master, who was the Grand Vizier. While in Constantinople, Abu Bakr al-Shirwani did advance in his household and, to, and he accompanied him on the ill-fated campaign to Vienna in 1683 that shortly afterwards cost Kara Mustafa Pasha his life. Just like al-Shirwani's library, Ahmed ibn al-Ajami's books also attest to the more dynamic exchange between center and periphery as he possessed some books by important earlier bibliophiles from Constantinople, like Muhammad bin Muhammad Juizade or Ali bin Amrila, known as Kinalizade which those two had apparently bought in the, Arab, in the Arabic provinces in the 16th century to be brought to the center, but which then again found their ways to a provincial library in the 17th. One of the main arguments of this talk is already here in a nutshell. While the attraction of the center was obviously much stronger in the long run, Constantinople was not a black hole for books that nothing could escape again. On the contrary, it could also be a source of precious manuscripts for provincial bibliophiles. This was a market and not a takeover. We do not know for certain when Abu Bakr al-Shirwani came to Egypt, but he was in the entourage of the province's governor Shishman Ibrahim Pasha, who served uh, in 1667 and 1668, and al-Shirwani left for Constantinople in 1672. At this point, Ahmed al-Ajami was an old man, but still alive. Could al-Shirwani have acquired the Kitab al-Arani from Ibn al-Ajami? Were there maybe even a gift from the Egyptian scholar eager to forge beneficial contacts with well-connected rising figures headed for the center? Or did they come to Constantinople at a later stage, from the estate of Ibn al-Ajami, when al-Shirwani had already risen in the ranks? While in Egypt, Abu Bakr al-Shirwani was just at the beginning of his stellar career in the Ottoman administration, and it would be very informative to know whether he was able, already at this early stage, to acquire such royal books as some of Lolo's Kitab al-Arani copies. But the Kitab al-Arani is not done enlightening us. We will now leave Constantinople again and return to Cairo, because no less than four of the seven surviving volumes of Badreddin Lutlus' luxurious production are in fact still preserved there. Now I have not been able yet to study those volumes. They are in a place that is very hard to access at the moment. But the initial portraits, uh, at least, have been published before. You can see that the quality of this material is not on the same level, um, so I had to take this from, uh, from old publications. Um, and there might be clues in these manuscripts, like in the other three volumes, that would enlighten us about their individual history. 
But one thing I can see even in these grainy pictures is the seal of Abdel Baki, which thankfully as one of the few exceptions is here placed on the first rectal page of the manuscript. This suggests that all seven volumes were still together in an endowed institution likely the Mu'ayyadiyya Madrasa in the middle of the 16th century and parted ways only afterwards. We should not forget that for any bibliophile there could hardly be a greater prize than these unique combinations of rare texts and unparalleled artworks. If the Ottomans were looking for books in 1517, it was those, but they didn't take them. If the French wanted to bring home artifacts worthy of study, it was those, but they didn't take them either. I want to propose that this example of seven volumes, anecdotal as it is, really is a more or less accurate reflection of the manuscript circulation in the Middle East over the roughly four centuries of Ottoman rule as a whole. Yes, Europeans played a role, one that increased during the 19th century, and peaked in the 20th, they could get their hands, hands on many outstanding texts and artifacts, but their role pales in comparison to that of the actors who made up the local book markets to which Europeans only had a peripheral address, access. They did usually not have more financial means or more power, certainly not than the judges, governors, administrators who were sent from the Ottoman center all across the empire and often returned with books. And both of these groups could not completely sideline local book lovers and scholars who were also able to amass great libraries and who were not above dismantling the old institutional collections that existed in their homelands, as had always been the case. In fact, when it comes to preservation, there are few success stories as those of the Ottoman collectors of Constantinople. The splendid libraries that they put together, especially in the 17th and 18th century, by and large still exist today. And that is why the books of Abu Bakr al-Shirwani are so ideal as an object of study of a vibrant, multi-directional marketplace. Because to talk about Constantinople's role as a magnet for books would only be one side of the story. With the institutional libraries still in Istanbul today, we are looking at Constantinople as a sort of black hole, where we see things come in but never get out again. Like so many other collections established in Ottoman Constantinople, the Faisullah Library, despite its founder's fate, was never dissolved. The Kitab al Arani stayed in Istanbul. The city thus is usually the endpoint for books that entered there. Shirwani, on the other hand, never established an endowment for his books. This is the great advantage and the prime reason for why he is a central figure in my new book. Here we can not only observe how books came to Ottoman Constantinople from many parts of the empire and beyond. Crucially, we can also follow the manuscripts when they were scattered again. When many stayed at the Bosporus, sure, but many also left Constantinople again some away from the Ottoman Empire, but mostly, at least initially, within it. Manuscript Wettstein 2, number 1, which is in Berlin today, illustrates this well. It too had a prestigious Egyptian history. It too was endowed in Cairo in the early 14th century, in an institution, the madrasa of a powerful political figure, a controversial man named Ibn Rudab. You can see his work note here, his endowment note, whose fate was not unlike that of Faisal Effendi. Sometime in the Ottoman period, it became part of al Ashirwani's library. After his death, it later passed through the hands of several statesmen, was even endowed in the city of Constantinople. But around the turn of the 19th century, it took the return trip and came to Damascus. So we can see this, this seal here of a man who I haven't really been able to identify yet, but uh, and it's it's uh, dated to around 1790, uh, but you find it on many books actually that, came, that were once in Constantinople and then are later found in Damascus. And indeed, um, we do see this note here that is largely vanished, but it's uh, vanished, but it belongs to a man that I uh, know. Uh, it's called Ibn Zaytuna, uh, who lived in Damascus in the in the first half of the 19th century, and from whom Wettstein likely bought this manuscript. Similar stories can be told about many of Ashirwani's books that we find today in the Arab world, such as in the Khalidiya Library in Jerusalem, the Assad Library in Damascus, or the Azhar Library in Cairo. As in the case of the Wettstein manuscript just mentioned, there are also many that came to Germany or France after having left Constantinople for Syria or Egypt. With the help of, with the help of provenance research beyond Europe, we can unearth those stories and paint a more accurate picture of the book cultures of the Ottoman world and beyond. When we are thinking about all the places that attracted Arabic books from the 16th to the 19th century, there is no bigger player than the seat of the Ottoman Sultan. 
Not only was it a major source for European collectors, so that many, for example, Mamluk manuscripts from Egypt or Syria came to Europe not because travelers plundered the libraries of Cairo and Damascus, but because they could get them on the book market of Constantinople. The books that uh, Levinus Varna, for example, sent back to Leiden um, and that are at the core of the, of the historical collection there are a case in point. Many, many uh, Mamluk books all acquired, not in Cairo, but in Constantinople. Constantinople is also the place where Arabic manuscripts accumulated of, over the 15th to 19th centuries more than anywhere else. And it is no secret how and why that happened. You find, my, you find many notes um, like this example that you can see here, in which an Ottoman chief judge of Cairo reports to have bought a book in Egypt. And then he would have brought it back to Istanbul, where it, is, where it now still is. Countless other officers were sent all across the empire, invested with power, money, and an appetite for books. So this is not surprising, and we could probably dub this a book drain to Constantinople. But the city was not a dead archive. Here, these books were also in use. They were productive. They were studied, cherished, copied, commented on. So when I am talking about book migrations, as I have done today, I'm not looking for someone to blame for the disintegration of libraries, to point out who stole what, to adjudicate who has a right to preserve which artifacts. My intention is to document a lively tradition of knowledge transmission and knowledge making in which these artifacts played a crucial role. For many centuries, much of that happened in Constantinople, and it did not happen only for one group to the detriment of others. Visitors from the Arabic provinces also played a role in this, and we can find many stories like this one. This is a manuscript with many texts that one Ahmed Ibn Mullah Al Halabi copied in Constantinople. It's very, very recognizable handwriting. So it's, uh, I guess, people who are familiar with the book cultures of, of, of Aleppo uh, would probably already see uh, that this is him. Uh, he copied it in Constantinople, though, in the end of the 16th century, using the city's rich libraries. And he brought those texts back to his native Aleppo, where they stayed in his family for several generations throughout the 17th century in their rich library. Just as members of this prominent family moved back and forth between provinces and center, so did the books they once owned. So when I call Constantinople the capital of Arabic literature, I mean by that, that Arabic literature was not only stored away there, but that it happened there and was accessible to many who came to the center from all sides. And also that the Arabic literature that we study and cherish today, to a surprisingly large extent, came to us through the Ottoman city. In my work, I want to portrait the people who used it, who made it a lively tradition, who made sure that it could survive, like Abu Bakr al-Shirwani. But we also have to keenly observe what came out from Constantinople and when. Measuring those books with the help of manuscript notes, such as the ones I have presented today, will be the challenge to elevate the, the analysis of the book cultures and book markets of the Middle East beyond the anecdotal. For that to happen, though, we have to overcome some problems of access and representation. Right now I can trace with great accuracy how books came to Constantinople because I have great access to many of the manuscripts that are still there and also many of those that came from there to Europe or North America. But Cairo at the moment is the dark hole and it is an extremely large one as its enormously rich libraries are quite inaccessible. Furthermore, we do not presently have the tools to follow the trails of book collectors. At the moment we are confronted with a growing body of data already overwhelming and complex that is hard to distill into neat trends and statistics. For a presentation such as today's one, it would have been crucial to have a list of all the manuscripts currently in Istanbul that were made in Cairo or Aleppo or Damascus, or that carry notes saying that they have been bought there and when, or that were once owned by people that we know were from these cities. Those are the questions uh, that can be answered with the help of notes, such as the ones that I have shown here today. But as we have also seen, they don't, offer, they don't offer these answers without putting in some work first. Because neither the seal of Abd al-Baqi Ibn al-Arabi nor the notes by Ash-Shirwani or Ibn al-Ajami tell us outright to which time and place they belong, or sometimes even what they mean. It is on us to collect a lot of this information from, dis from disparate sources and feed it into a database so that we can then ask the pertinent questions. And we already have a lot of this data that will in the future allow us to map and model the individual trajectories general trends and clusters of the book markets. In the project Biblioteca Arabica, where I have the privilege to work, I have so far transcribed around 70,000 of those notes, and this work is picking up pace with the increased access that digitization affords. And with this hopeful outlook, I want to end and thank you for your attention.